Welcome to My Mind's Eye, where we talk about mind and brain and listen to music about those topics. Well, the roots of the tree are deep in the ground. They dive and they branch and twist all around. Today we're going to be talking with Corey Bardman of the Rockefeller University about the roots of behavior. We believe that the complex abilities of humans are built upon foundations that were originally present in animals. You are my roots. You are my roots. Corey, like many neuroscientists of our generation, you came to the nervous system from another field. How did you make the transition from studies of cancer to studies of the nervous system in the worm C. elegans? I started in science at a period that you can think of as the revolution of molecular genetics. The point at which from the first time in history we were starting to identify the genes that carried out biological functions. And then it started to extend to cellular systems, and I worked on the role of genes in cancer. And the next logical step was to try to think about how genes were involved in more and more complex systems. and behavior and the nervous system is more complex than cancer. But it seemed that that might be an area where the study of genes could make progress as well. I picked C. elegans as an experimental organism because it was an animal that had unique advantages for studying the brain. So C. elegans, we know now, has about 20,000 genes in its genome. Humans only have about 25,000 genes. That's not so different. Our brains have 86 billion neurons in them. And the C. elegans brain has just 302 neurons. And so when trying to move from the level of genes to how those affect a brain, to how those affect what an animal does, you have a much easier problem in the worm. Your work is especially focused on olfaction and finding genes related to olfactory related behaviors in worms. How did you get involved in this and tell us about some of the research uh, studies that you've done in your lab on olfaction in worms. When my lab started to work on olfaction in um, the late 80s and early 90s, literally nobody really knew how it worked at all in any organism. And so we looked through millions and millions of worms and we found worms that couldn't smell. And we found some worms that couldn't smell anything, and those were interesting. But the worms we were most interested in were the worms that could smell everything except one thing. Butter. And there are examples of convergent evolution of related genes carrying out related functions. Very specifically, the butter sensor in our nose is a convergent evolution from the butter sensor in the worm's nose. And we think the reason for that is it's important to smell in general, but exactly what you're smelling, it matters what animal you are. Now, one of the things we've learned over the past 20 years of studying the genes in the brain is that many of the genes that are used in the nervous system of all animals are shared between those animals and humans, and they do related things but they don't necessarily do exactly the same things because there are new activities for those genes that have been invented since the animal separated. The sense of smell is often used by different organisms to recognize members of their own species. In animals, we describe the chemicals that animals use to communicate with each other as pheromones. That's the specific kind of chemical that one animal makes that it uses to signal to other animals in the species. And 
worms, like other animals, communicate through pheromones, and it's kind of amazing how much they communicate. They can communicate to other worms through their pheromones, how many worms there are, how old they are, whether they're male or hermaphrodite, whether they're of reproductive status, whether they're hungry, whether they've been hungry in the past. Each of those is associated with a different mixture of pheromones, which the detecting worm can sense and respond to in particular ways. And we have used the C. elegans as a model to understand two features of social behavior. One is mating behavior, um, the ability of animals to select and interact with a mating partner. And the second is aggregation behavior because animals, many animals, including worms, will aggregate under some circumstances and will be, um, will move around independently under other circumstances. Because the right social behavior depends so much on the context of the animal, what other things are going on, and what the other animals are doing. We don't believe that animals can do everything humans can do, but we believe that the complex abilities of humans are built upon foundations that were originally present in animals and have become more elaborate and sophisticated in our own brains. You are my roots. I'm constantly now, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. As a neuroscientist, I think it was one of the most exciting moments of my life when the President of the United States in the State of the Union address said that it was important for our country to support discoveries in neuroscience. And that was the first steps toward the launch of the Brain Initiative, which has been taking place in both the private and the and the public sector throughout the United States since 2013 when it was first announced. It's an initiative for science. The goal is to understand the brain and understand how the brain works. And it's a privilege as a scientist to think, you know, my elected officials, my Congress people, the citizens of the U.S. Through, the, through their taxes are willing to support the adventure of understanding how the brain works, not just because it will cure diseases, but because it's a fascinating problem. And there couldn't be anything more wonderful than understanding ourselves. Thank you very much for talking with us about this today. Love.